Uh, so yeah, my name is Aviv and I'm working in uh, Riskified, uh, thanks to the Ydata team for inviting me to talk. Uh, and I'm going to present a use case of uh, using Catboost uh, in, in Riskified. Uh, so first, a short introduction. So as I said, I'm working in Riskified as a data scientist for the past uh, uh, more than a year. Uh, in Riskified, we're working mostly about uh, uh, fraud in the e-commerce world. Um, before that, I'm going to speak about it more uh, in a bit. Before that, I was, I was uh, studying in uh, Ben Gurion University. Uh, I did my master in uh, the Industrial Engineering and Management uh, uh, Department. Uh, and my uh, thesis was about uh, working on medical data and, and modeling it uh, temporally. Uh, so that's just a short introduction. So what are we going to uh, speak about today? So a little bit about Riskified to understand the domain, uh, to learn what uh, type of uh, task we're dealing with. What's the machine learning part in a risky file? After that, we're going to speak about uh, boosting libraries exper experiment. Uh, so last year, we had a comprehensive experiment uh, to compare the leading, uh, uh, cut boost, the leading uh, uh, boosting libraries. Um, so you're going to hear about that. Then we'll see how CutBoost helped us in risky file. And eventually, uh, we're going to talk about how we uh, implemented CutBoost in production, whether if it was uh, smooth or not. So that's generally what we're going to talk about. So what's Riskify? Riskify is a startup that is based in Tel Aviv. We also have a branch in New York. Uh, we have almost 500 employees. And uh, as I said, we're focusing on uh, preventing fraud in the e-commerce world. Uh, that means that we have merchants that we're working with that are selling their uh, products online. Um, and we're helping, helping them to review transactions, to review orders, and to decide if they are fraud or not. That's like the main thing. We have a suite of uh, products uh, related to fraud. We're reviewing over uh, 2 million transactions a day, and we have uh, many companies working with us. You can see the list over here. Companies from many industries, such as Wish, Booking.com, Macy's, and many others that you can see here. And I'm going to focus on one of our products that is called the Chargeback Guarantee Model. And before that, I have a few questions for you. So who was ever declined when you tried to buy online? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a few. Another question, whose credit card was ever stolen, was used online? Okay, wow, I thought there would be less. And in these cases, when someone is using your credit card, who do you think eventually, and you ask your card issuer, Visa or MasterCard, to get the money back? Who do you think pays uh, the money? Who do you think, the like? Okay, so some say that it's the uh, uh, insurance, some say the credit card company, and some say the merchants. So I, was, I found it surprising, but it's the merchant that eventually is paying uh, you the money back. That means that if, for instance, we look at Macy's as the merchant, so eventually each fraudulent order that went uh, uh, through their uh, uh, purchasing uh, pipeline, that means that they will have to pay uh, back the customer. So that means that they can lose a lot of money, a lot of the revenue to fraudsters, and of course they want to solve this problem. And that's where we come in. So that's the pipeline of our product. So in the beginning of it, let's say that the customer comes and he places an order uh, in Macy's. He want to buy a pair of sneakers. But we still don't know if this customer is legit or not. Then the, the, the order goes through the payment gateway that makes sure the uh, card is valid, that it's not expired, and some other things. And then Riskified come in, comes into the picture. So here we have a machine learning model that eventually decides whether to approve or decline the order. We take all the data that we have regarding the transaction, regarding the user, whatever we can use to make the best decision regarding the transaction. And there, there are a few options. If we think the order is fraudulent, we can decline it. And if we think it's legit, then we can approve it. And then there's another two options. Uh, if the customer is legit, then uh, it's great. Uh, we get the merchant get the money, the customer gets the product, and everybody's happy. And of course, there's another option that we made a mistake. And then we have a chargeback. The customer asks for the money back. And here, Riskify say another thing. In case we approved an order that uh, uh, was a chargeback that was fraudulent, then we will pay the money back to the customer. And so the merchant has a kind of insurance. We also de we're also deciding uh, whether to approve or decline the order. And we also pay for uh, orders that we approved and were fraud. So that's generally about. Uh, our uh, product, like the main product. And one more thing that is important in the machine learning context, as I said, that's a machine learning based um, uh, decision engine. 
And if we're talking about labels or ground truth, so we do not have ground truth for all of our data. If we prove an order and it's fraudulent, then we have the ground truth for that. If we approve an order and it's legit, then that's great. We also have the ground truth for that. But if we decline an order, then we have a problem. We do not know uh, eventually what uh, happened with the order, whether it was a legit customer or whether it was a fraudulent. So that's just something to keep in mind uh, for a few slides. Uh, Okay, so I just told you that the chargeback guarantee model is a machine learning model. What other things we're dealing uh, with in Riskify? So we have some anomaly detection problems, population segmentation, uh, complex feature engineering using NLP, for example. And so some of the models that we use are boosted trees model. And that's what uh, led us to the uh, boosting experiment that you had. So first of all, why boosting? So in Riskify, we're working with a lot of tabular data. For each transaction, we have a very long vector with many features uh, regarding the transaction. And in addition to that, we have many categorical features with many levels, and that's why we use uh, uh, a boosting. We, we use it even before this experiment. So, so in our initial status, when we started the experiment, we worked with the GBM library, with the gradient boosting machine library, and we actually liked it because it was very accurate. It gave us good, good performance. And uh, so we uh, used it for a while. But it had one uh, main problem. The training time of the, uh, of the GBM was very, very slow. It means that if you had to run uh, an experiment with full hyperparameter tuning and a large data set, it could sometimes take us up to 48 hours of training. And that means that it could really stack our research flow and uh, we can find ourselves, uh, if we have to run the experiment twice, then it's getting really, really long. And uh, we said, okay, we should do something about it. We should try and uh, replace it with one of the newer uh, libraries. And so we said, okay, let's have a survey and uh, an experiment for the CatBoost, IGBM, and XGBoost uh, libraries uh, in order to understand like, uh, which one can uh, help us to replace GBM and have a faster training cycle. I can say that in production, GBM had a good uh, uh, performance, like the speed met our requ requirements. Uh, but in uh, training, it, really, it was really, really slow, and we wanted to replace it. And so just about the survey, I'm going to speak about the main conclusion that uh, I had. Um, as Kostya mentioned, I have a blog post about it that I'm going to share the link in the end if you want to hear more about it. But I'm just going to speak about the main uh, points uh, from the survey. So the first thing is that there is still no one perfect library. Uh, each library has uh, unique features. Uh, each library has its own uh, characteristics. And when you approach a new machine learning problem, you should consider all, for example, the three, the three uh, uh, libraries uh, that I just mentioned. And I thought what would be interesting for you to hear uh, from the whole survey. So I decided to focus on several points that when you approach a new machine learning problem, you should think about some of them uh, Anna Veronica mentioned uh, before. Uh, so the first thing is the, your data's categorical features. So each one of the libraries treat categorical features differently. For example, Exibus does not have a built-in mechanism or a method for dealing with uh, categorical features. And uh, that means that the user should encode the categorical feature by himself using one hot encoding, mean encoding, whatever. Uh, he would like to use, and we found it a bit of a problem because when we took our data that has around 300 features, uh, when we used one-hot encoding, we got to 900 features, which means that the training process was much slower. And uh, in addition to that, uh, um, and we didn't like the fact that we have a lot of one-hot encoded variables, that most of our features are one-hot encoded variables. So that's about XGBoost. LightGBM uh, and CADBoost are a bit more complicated. Uh, cut boost, so one of Veronica explained before, so I'm not going to uh, get into it. Uh, and, but about LightGBM, so LightGBM actually, actually takes each categorical feature, and it takes the levels of the categorical feature, and it sorts them uh, with respect to the uh, loss function. And then only a few uh, possible splits are available. So it means that you cannot just split all the levels to uh, branches the way uh, it doesn't look at all the uh, possible splits, but only certain splits. Uh, so that's generally about the categorical features, so you should think what fits your uh, needs. The other thing is how they treat missing values. So XGBoost and IGBM treat them more or less the same. Uh, in each split, they, the missing values, the null values, are assigned to the branch that will, that will minimize the loss function, while CutBoost uh, add a unique value 
for uh, the, the null values. That means that if, for example, you have a feature that is between minus one and one, then Catboost will uh, assign all the null features to one plus epsilon, for example, and this way it will allow a split that will split all the null values from all the regular values. Another thing is the model serving limitations. Um, so each library support, you should think about your end goal. You're working on a new model, it can be amazing, it can have the uh, best accuracy in the world, but you should think what's your end goal? Where are you going to use the model? Uh, is it going to be in production? And that means uh, that if you're going to use it in production or in some other uh, 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 way, so you will have to think uh, how the library helps you to do that, whether the library supports your production language and how you're going to do it because uh, if you, as I said, if you work with a certain library, you might find out that you can't eventually implement it uh, the way that you uh, wanted to do it, so you should keep that in mind. Uh, community strength. So out of all the three, I can set it XGBoost because it is the oldest uh, one of them, uh, has the strongest community. It means that it's easier to find uh, answers to your problems uh, online. Uh, but Catboost and LightGBM has, and Catboost has a, uh, a bit of a weaker community, but Catboost offer, just as Anna Veronica mentioned, uh, the Telegram channel, for example, which I found really, really useful. You can see here a co correspondence uh, with a team I had back uh, a few months ago, and uh, they actually helped me to understand what's the best production uh, method that I can use. Uh, and I hope that now that I shared it with you, it won't be uh, flooded uh, with questions, uh, but that's just a great tool that they offer. Within a few hours, I got uh, an answer and a solution to my problem. And the last thing is the environment. Uh, all the libraries suppose, uh, supports both R and Python, and uh, you should think what wor worked out best for you. Uh, for example, in Catboost, most features are first uh, released in uh, Python, and then they are released in R. Some of the features are, are still not available in R. Uh, and so if you have the privilege, I think uh, it's better to work in Python in that case, in the case of Catboost. But still, 95% of the features are available in both of the environments. So these are just a quick uh, points from the survey. Okay, about the experiment setup. So we worked in R. We had four data sets. Each one of them had 100K observations uh, and 300 uh, features uh, in each data set. And around a third of them were categorical. We used a three-fold cross-validation, repeated it three times per each data set plus library combination. So for the first data set, we did it for CutBoost, LightGBM, and, and uh, and XGBoost and repeated it three times. And before we see the results, so we just uh, talk about what are we maximizing. So we use the log loss uh, uh, loss function, uh, but I take you back to, the, to our model, to the charger guarantee model. So how does it work? And we'll see the problem that we have with the labels. So you can see here that when an order is submitted, it can be either approved or declined. Um, if, let's go on the easy side, if we approve it, then we know what the labels are. If it's a chargeback, if we get a chargeback eventually, then the label is fraud. It's uh, much easier. If it's not a chargeback after a while, we do not get a chargeback, then the label is not fraud. But what happens if we uh, decline the order? Then we don't know what uh, the label is. And in this case, we have some internal tool to estimate the risk of the declines. Uh, so we use this estimated risk, and we have a new metric that we created that is called we call it weighted AUC. Uh, it's actually a modified AUC that takes into account the risk of each, uh, of each decline. So it has more or less the same properties as, as AUC, so you can just treat it as AUC with a fix for the uh, labels of the declines. So that's what we were maximizing, maximizing the weighted AUC. And now for the uh, weighted AUC results, uh, you can see here the four data sets and the four algorithms. Uh, Catboost had the best uh, weighted AUC in all four uh, data sets. If you look closer, you can see that in the last three data sets, the uh, differences are pretty minor. Uh, but for us, it's very meaningful. Uh, we, from our experiments, we know that even a minor improvement in weighted AUC can be translated eventually to a lot of fraud prevention. And then this was significant. We looked at four data sets, uh, we repeated the experiment a few times, and we saw that Catboost got uh, the best uh, weighted AUC eventually. So it had the best accuracy or weighted AUC. And when we go to the speed result, uh, we can see, uh, as I promised you, GBM is really slow. And after that, 
what we can see here is on the, the x-axis, we can see the data sets. On the y-axis, we can see the, the time of, the, of a single training. And GBM is the slowest, then XGBoost, then CutBoost, and then uh, LightGBM, uh, which was the fastest. LightGBM was 15 times was 15 time faster than uh, uh, GBM, and it was three times faster than uh, CutBoost. But still, we can say that all the three uh, libraries are uh, fast when comparing it to GBM. So when we had to come to a selection of which algorithm are we going to use, which library are we going to use, so as I told you, eventually we want the best uh, performance when it comes to accuracy, and since CutBoost had uh, the best way that you've seen, it was also fast. In comparison to LightGBM, it might be slower, but it was pretty fast. Uh, so eventually we decided in many task, tasks to go with CutBoost, and if we need uh, sometimes a uh, faster uh, training cycle, so we might also work with IGBM in some cases. So we chose CutBoost. And I'm just going to share with you a few uh, features that we liked, some of them Anna Veronica mentioned. Uh, so the first thing is hyperparameters robustness. Uh, so it's very important for us if we want to have a quick uh, POCs, if we want to check new features that we have. Uh, so we do not have to go through the whole process of hyperparameter tuning. Um, the model, we can have default parameters, or I can say semi-default parameters, like parameters that we know that works out pretty well for the test that we're trying. And uh, it can help us to move on faster, much, uh, to move on much faster. The second thing is GPU ease of use. So for example, in R, you if you have CUDA and everything working fine, so you can just add the test type of GPU and everything works uh, great. And another thing is ongoing and stable releases. So as Anna Veronica mentioned, they release uh, a new version every few weeks, and it's not only bug fixes, but also uh, new features that uh, help and can solve uh, problems that we encounter uh, uh, when, on our daily day, uh, job. And uh, there's still much more to explore, so things that we still, that we got into, but we uh, still didn't uh, uh, manage to implement. So for example, the object importance, that's something that allows you to, um, after you, you're done training a model, so you can take each instance of the in the training set and understand how it, con it con contributed to the final model. So for some instances, you'll see uh, that they really uh, contributed to the model and others didn't uh, contribute at all. And using that, you, might, you can find, for example, uh, outliers in your data. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing that was just released recently uh, is monoforest for model <coughs> interpretation. Uh, so what it does basically, it takes every tree and it transform, transforms it to a polynomial form. And this allows to uh, analyze the tree much easier than just having the tree structure. That's another thing. And another, the last thing is uh, easy cross-validation, search, uh, training, plotting. So just by adding in Python an argument for plotting, you can get a nice and easy to use uh, plots without taking care of it by yourself. So that's about features that we like and features that we still uh, need to explore. And the last thing uh, is the research to production, so how we chose to do that. If you uh, read the correspondence, so it was about that. Um, and how we do that in uh, our production language is Scala. And so we worked with a, a library called ai.catboost that is available uh, for uh, Scala. And that's how we uh, chose to do it. On the research side, what we do is we train a model in R or Python. Then we export the model to a binary format. That's very easy to do. Uh, in both, uh, in both uh, languages, R and Python, using the CutBoost uh, library, you can save it to a binary format. And it's great not only because we can uh, take it to production, but also because we work in both R and Python. And so we can save a model in R read it in Python and work with it as if it was trained in uh, Python. So that's one uh, side. And the other side is we have to save a YAML, uh, a YAML file containing the features data. So we should, in order to, to pre-process the new data on the, on the production side, the data that we need to score in production. So what we save is the, um, the features type. And we also save it whether it, if it was categorical or numeric. And the other thing, we save the levels uh, of the categorical features. So we'll have it in production. Then in production, it's pretty smooth. We read the model using the library. And uh, we read the, and we can work with it. We also read the YAML file. And then we can pre-process uh, the, the new data that we need to score. And by doing these two things, uh, we can uh, make the prediction. So that's very smooth. We can, as the 
research side that's working with production, we need to save only two, uh, two files to have them, and then uh, uh, in production they can take these files and work uh, with, the, with the models, and we can replace them whenever we need. Uh, so that's about research to production. So just uh, some key takeaways from the talk. Uh, so when you're starting to work on a new machine learning problem and you think you want to use boosting, you should consider working with all the boosting libraries because you might find something that is unique that can fit your needs. Uh, another thing is that after we uh, did this uh, step, we found CutBoost fast and accurate, and that's why uh, we chose to use it for many of our, of our uh, daily uh, tasks, for many of our, of our machine learning tasks. Uh, it's easy to use and it has advanced features that keep coming and you can uh, use them and find solutions to other problems that you have. And we found the transition from research to uh, production pretty smooth. And as I promised, here you have a QR code of the blog that I wrote. It's containing both the survey and uh, uh, experiments results. So you can uh, scan the, uh, the QR code and see the full blog. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions? Yeah. <coughs> Regarding the research to production. Yeah. Uh, just asking a question to you and Veronica. Is this the best practice? Uh, binary alongside the YAML file? So I'm not sure what is the good way with Scala. I don't think we have Scala. Oh. Why I think AI yeah, does have this is something that not from our library. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, so there there are different ways you you can uh, you can use the binary. We also plan to add the the in the in memory model, uh, which which is useful if you have a very large model with categorical features. That's something that we will add in one of, of one of the sooner releases. But if if uh, your model is not that big, then you don't care about that. You just load it into memory and you can, you can reload it. Everything. My question is the YAML file. Kind of alongside the binary file. Is something yeah, invented, or is something that came from? So it's something we thought of because we had to keep uh, uh, the, as I said, the features data of the the type and the uh, levels of each categorical feature because there is no solution for that in the model file, right? In the binary file. Uh, so what, what's in the when we go to production, we have new data that we need to yeah. pre-process or make the two arrays, the numeric array and the. Uh, oh, yeah, so we have so we had to keep the we have to write the YAML file. We could not uh, do it without it. That is it correct or? Uh, so so you, is it not necessary to write the YAML file? But if yeah. You, yeah. Okay, so you have to sample alongside the models and metadata that you guys have to find your own uh, solution for. Uh, exactly. Which doesn't solve for it. That's my question. Yeah, like the model doesn't include uh, the feature types and the uh, categorical features level. Is it correct? So the model does include the, the types if the feature is categorical or not, but you, when you are applying the model, uh, the, the interface, uh, mm. or the C++ interface does require from you to separate yeah. categorical ones from numerical ones. Uh, some interfaces, I'm not sure about this particular one, also, also have this. Yeah, but you can you can ask from the model which features are categorical, which not. Ah, okay, we didn't know that. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Yes. Thanks. Uh, did you try uh, like an ensemble or uh, model stack? Sorry. Ensemble. So. Ense ensemble of uh, of uh, boosting line. Uh, no, I, we actually haven't tried that uh, up until now. Because it's not using practice or just. Uh, up until now, we worked with one gradient boosting uh, model, and uh, that worked for us with a uh, gradient boosting machine. And when we switched to CutBoost, that also worked out for us. Uh, it's a good idea, but we haven't tried it yet. Okay, thank you.